Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I am one of your hosts for today, John DeLynn. Uh, it is uh, today's Mormon Stories Podcast book club edition. Today, we are here to discuss a really important uh, book that's come out this year-ish. Uh, the book is called Vengeance is Mine, The Mountain Meadows Massacre and Its Aftermath. The two authors are Richard E. Turley, Jr., uh, former uh, historian for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or the LDS Church, and Barbara Jones Brown, who is here in studio with us. Hey, Barbara. Hey. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's exciting to be here. Yeah. And for those of you who have been following Mormon Stories this year, this is Barbara's, I don't know, second or third time to be on Mormon Stories at least. Yeah, second she's, time. Yeah. She's been on talking about Sandra Tanner, and she also was on recently with Sarah Patterson to talk about the uh, September 6th. Um, but uh, Barbara Jones Brown is not just a historian of a really important book, but also she runs Signature Books, which is, in my mind, one of the most important um, book makers in all of Mormon history. How's that? Is that too much? Did I go <laughs> over the top it. there? I'll take it. Thank you, John. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm also super excited to have uh, co-hosting on Mormon Stories Book Club, as we always do, the Rebecca Biblioteca. Hey, Rebecca. <laughs> hey, John. Hey, Barbara. How are you guys today? Good. Good. How are you? Great, great. Super excited to be here. Yeah. In studio yeah. for the first time for an entire year. So this is great. Yeah. And Rebecca um, is the reason why we have a Mormon Stories Book Club. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, give give the time over to her. I do want to welcome our, our live streaming audience. We're grateful for you. We're always grateful for uh, your chats and your super chats and your donations, but I also want to just thank the Base Mormon Stories donor audience uh, who make all this possible. So thanks to everyone who donates to Mormon Stories podcast. You can do that at mormonstories.org, uh, become a monthly donor, and we'll be able to keep creating content like this. But um, Rebecca has some news items that we're going to have her begin with because she is in charge of this book club thing. Well, there we go. And also feel, feel free to plug your own stuff. <laughs> ah, there we go. Um, yeah, book club business, always at the top of the hour, right? So as John said, today we are going to be discussing Vengeance is Mine. We have the amazing Barbara Jones Brown in our studio today. Um, usually we introduce the next book that's coming up. Um, in the current episode that we're doing, we have a couple books in the works. Um, this won't be until January, so we're we're looking at uh, the book Romney: A Reckoning by McKay Coppins as a possible book, which would be absolutely amazing. Maybe Barbara and, can help us get McKay Coppins on more stories. You know, I feel like maybe Barbara could, or maybe <laughs> right now I, we'll just put a plea out to McKay. We would love to have you on. This would be incredible. So this, all this viewers book and listeners, amazing. bother, bug, <laughs> yes. annoy, harass, yes. stalk McKay Coppins <laughs> until he responds to our emails. I'm My just husband kidding. is a journalist and knows McKay, so I'll All right. see. Okay, All right. there it is. Yeah, yeah, I've reached out a couple times, but who am I, right? So it would He's be been great. on Mormon Stories before. So. Yeah, I, I think probably we'll get but a hold a of cool, him. But that's a cool, that Romney book has oh. really taken the nation by storm. Yep. It? Yeah, and I'm kind of proud of Mitt Romney yep. and what he's done. So. Yep. Yeah. No, I think that's perfectly suited for the Mormon Stories Book Club, so we hopefully um, have that on your radar, everybody. We will hopefully be having McKay on maybe January, February, or whenever he's able to come on. Um, also, How to Change Minds by um, David McCravey. We're reaching out to him, too, which is a really good book. So these are two things. Look for announcements on these coming up in the next couple months. In the meantime, however, I did not want to leave you all bookless for Christmas <laughs> and the holidays. Um, so I'm just going to make a recommendation of a book. Um, this is a book that we've read in my book club, the other one that I run, The Good Book Club. And this book is called For Small Creatures Such as We, Rituals for Finding Meaning in Our Unlikely World. And this is written by Sasha Sagan. She is the daughter of Carl Sagan, if you're familiar with who that is, um, the uber astronomer scientist of the 70s and 80s who had many different books and television shows. This book is important, especially for post or nuanced Mormons um, during the holiday season, because it talks about when you lose your rituals, if you step away from your religion or your ideology, and what do you replace it with? That's a question that a lot of people ask. How do I celebrate this now? How do I mark this event? She talks about secular rituals that you can develop that are very personalized for you and your family. And it's just an absolutely beautiful book. So if you're looking for something to read, to help you in the holidays, just to find out how to make them more meaningful in perhaps a more secular way, if that's where you are right now. 
cannot recommend this book enough. And it's possible that we'll be reaching out to Sasha and having her on the Mormon Stories Book Club because she's a wonderful person too. So everybody grab this book. Uh, for small creatures such as we, rituals for finding meaning in our unlikely world. It's a quick read, but I guarantee it will sort of change your life. It's pretty amazing. So that's all I have right now, John. Let's dive in with Barbara. <laughs> Perfect. And I'm just going to start by saying, everyone, please... Uh, Open up a tab in your browser right now or <laughs> pause your podcast, pull over on the side of the road or stop lawn, mowing your lawn, <laughs> go to Amazon or Signature Book or Benchmark Books or wherever you can buy a book and buy this book. We want to encourage and promote and support Mormon history, Mormon scholarship, Mormon studies. And this book is as worthy as a book is. I've loved it. Uh, it's an important book, so please go buy it and buy it for. It's a great Christmas gift, don't you think, Barbara? Uh, well, it's a little <laughs> grim for Christmas, but it's but it's always good to read. And I would also add that the audiobook version is excellent yeah. if you prefer audiobooks, and there's also the Kindle version as well. But the actor that the press hired to read the book is excellent, and he does all the voices. Um, he even pronounces most of the Mormon terms correctly. He actually says. Lamanites and Nephi instead of Nephi and Lamanites, things like that. That's, so, that's awesome. Um, yeah, it's a great audiobook as well. Yeah. Okay, so uh, it's time to dive in. We're going to kind of do three ish parts uh, to this episode. Part one is going to be kind of learning about Barbara's story and how she got interested in uh, this topic. It's a really moving and uh, meaningful part. It's also great to understand Barbara a little bit better. I want to have Barbara on to do a long form, uh, but that won't be today. Maybe that'll be someday in the future. Part two will be just telling the story of the Mountain Meadows Massacre. Believe it or not, we're 18 years into the history of Mormon Stories podcast, and we've never told the story of the Mountain Meadows Massacre. Um, we did on a Mormon Matters obscure episode back when Mormon Matters podcast first started. But this is the first time on Mormon Stories. So Barbara, you get the, I can't think of a better person to do that. And then we're going to um, end by having some Q&A. Rebecca's got some great questions and we'll entertain questions from uh, you, our live audience. But if we had to describe how severe or significant the Mountain Meadows Massacre was, I was going to say one of the biggest massacres in the history of the United States, but that's probably not even close to true if you count Native American populations. Yes. So how how is it described in terms of how significant it was in the history of U.S. massacres, let's just say. Yeah, well, I'm glad you brought up the fact that there have been many Native American massacres, massacres of Native Americans um, that were larger in number um, but and, and more in number. So it's always important to recognize that there's not just one massacre in our history. Um, in terms of the Mountain Meadows Massacre, it is significant in that it was committed by members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, um, a religious group, and they wiped out a wagon train of immigrants headed for California. And so for the church history and for Utah history, it's very significant for that reason. Yeah. And yeah, and, and the numbers are quite large. Yes, yeah. um, some 100 innocent people, men, women, and children were slaughtered. Yeah. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about that. Um, and uh, But before we do, let's start with your story, Barbara. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, your kind of whatever you want to share about your life before Mountain Meadows. <laughs> sure. And then how you got into it. Sure. Um, so the first time I heard about the Mountain Meadows Massacre, um, I was 22 years old, recently returned from an LDS mission to Japan. Um, I was a BYU graduate, uh, LDS uh, high school seminary graduate, and had never heard of it. But uh, my father was really into Mormon history as a hobby and Mormon um, er, and uh, Americana and so forth. So he collected all kinds of artifacts and books and things like that. So we had all kinds of historical paintings and prints and things hanging around our house. And so there was one I had always seen, and it's a depiction of this mountainous valley. It's an 1877 lithograph, and there's um, a wagon train kind of rolling into the valley. And so I'd never paid much attention to it until one day I was sitting in our family room and got up out of an easy chair in the family room and looked closely at this print that was hanging be behind that easy chair. And I started looking, and for the first time, I noticed in the lower right-hand corner um, very racialized depictions of Native Americans hiding in rocks, and they had 
clubs and knives in between their teeth and they're kind of menacingly looking at this wagon train and then at the bottom of this 1877 print it said mountain meadows and i said dad what what's the mountain meadows and he says well um it's a group of mormon militiamen and a group of indians reportedly wiped out a wagon train of people headed for California in Southwest Utah in 1857. And I felt like I'd been punched in the gut. Um, like many of your listeners, I had grown up just only hearing, hearing wonderful stories about my church's history and about my family history, um, including in 1856, how one of my ancestors had been one of the rescuers that went out to save a wagon train and handcart companies who were stranded on the plains went out to rescue them, save their lives, heroic stories like that. And I thought, how, how did the same people who rescued people in 1856, not the exact same people, but this Latter-day Saints, the following year wipe out an innocent wagon company? How on earth could that happen? So I asked my dad why, and he said, we just don't know a lot about it. He said, supposedly these people who were killed were bragging that they had the gun that killed Joseph Smith and had poisoned a spring as they're heading through Utah. And my reaction was, so how does that justify this? And he said, honey, we just really don't know that much about it. I didn't know at that time that a historian named Juanita Brooks had published a book called Massacre, the Mountain Meadows Massacre in 1950. So I didn't read anything about it at that time, but I kind of put it on my back burner and I was just someday I wanted to know how something like that could happen. Is it worth mentioning just really briefly how important of a figure and heroic and inspirational of a figure Juanita Brooks was? Or, or if you want to say that later, but I consider her top 10. No, let's talk about Juanita Brooks. Hero. Yeah. In fact, if you look at Vengeance is Mine on the dedication page, we dedicate our book to Juanita Brooks Beautiful. because she was the first who, against all odds, had the courage to tell the story of her community's uh, grim and covered up secret. And she was and faithful, right? Yes, she was. And also, uh, the end. she was like, I, I have pictures of her like ironing the clothes <laughs> as like a stay at home mom and then writing the book almost at night, pre internet, pre yeah. women so, working outside the home. So you know. I met Juanita Brooks's sons, and they, you know, I just asked them, what was it like to grow up with, with Juanita as your mom? <laughs> and they said, well, what she would do is, um, Back in the 30s and 40s, when she's doing her scholarly work, it wasn't so popular for uh, a housewife at the time to be doing scholarly research. And so what she would do is she would have a pile of ironing on her ironing board and an iron. And if anyone came over to visit her, she didn't want to be bothered with long visits. And so she would say, oh, I've got so much ironing. I need to do good to see you and then as soon as the visitor would leave she'd sit back at her typewriter and go back to her her scholarly work so it wasn't just uh, the mountain meadows massacre that she wrote about she wrote several books and spent her life doing historical research and writing and she so, faced a little bit of threats of disciplinary church discipline correct she uh she definitely was ostracized by her community it was looked down upon to uh bring forth this secret that they just felt like look let's let bygones be bygones, not talk about this anymore, and how dare you, why are you bringing this to the surface? We don't want to talk about this. And again, she published this in 1950, so it was a different time. Yeah, and five years after Juanita, I mean, after Joanna. Yeah, sure. After shortly Brody, after Fawn Brody, Brody published yeah. No Man Knows My History, which yeah. I believe was 1946. And they were friends and contemporaries, oh, Juanita wow. and, yeah. and Fawn. Back to your story. So, okay, so, <laughs> yeah, so make a long story short, Juanita Brooks is my heroine. Hmm. I don't agree with all of her um, findings in her book because we've done so much more research since then, but I, she will always be my heroine and she was my inspiration. Just her courage in telling the story. I've always wanted to be what, like Juanita and that's why we dedicate our book to her and we actually, the book ends with her Beautiful. as well. Beautiful. So, um, so back to my story. So as I was saying, so in the early 90s, I first heard about the Mount Meadows Massacre determined someday I want to learn about this and, and, and try to 
grasp how this could happen. Um, I went on to become a professional editor and worked in editing professionally for 20 plus years. I was an editor for the New Era magazine and for the Ensign magazines for the LDS Church. And uh, when I started to have kids, I decided to just start working from home and do freelance work. And so I, by then I was starting to get interested in history and in Mormon history. And so I turned in a resume to uh, Elder Marlin K. Jensen of the church history department. At the, at the time, he was church historian. And uh, he and my dad were roommates at BYU, so oh. I, I had a personal relationship with him. So I left him a resume, said, hey, if the church history department ever needs some freelance editing, I'd be interested. Didn't hear anything for months. And several months later, I got a call from Rick Turley. And he said, I'd like you to come in and interview for a full-time position doing editing work. And I said, ah, I had just found out we were expecting our second daughter and we had a little three-year-old. So I was like, oh, I don't know if I'm, I'm ready for full-time work at this time. And I said, what would you want me to do? And he said, I want you to edit my book on the Mountain Meadows Massacre. And I said, I'll be right there. <laughs> So I uh, went in, had an interview with him, and it was just one of those experiences, you know, some of us have where we just feel like, I'm supposed to do this. This doesn't make any sense, but I'm supposed to do this. So I, so I accepted his offer and began working full time on the book. Um, and that's not this book. That's on its the predecessor. First book. It's yes, predecessor, that's right. right. So Vengeance is Mine is actually second in a sequel in, in yeah. a series. So the first book was called Massacre at Mountain Meadows. So I started editing that. And as any good editor will do, I started digging into the primary sources and reading every primary source I could get my hands on so that I could be familiar with this subject. And what I was learning was horrific. Mm. Um, and I might become emotional. Um, I would, um, I was really grateful. I had an office with a door that I could close mm. because I all, uh, often found myself weeping at my desk as I was reading firsthand accounts mm. of this horrific atrocity. Mm. Um, I was experiencing and, and others on the staff as well, working on the subject where we were experiencing um, PTSD like symptoms. I was having nightmares. Sometimes I would break down crying uncontrollably or like find myself zoning off and finding myself picturing the mountain meadows, uh, lots of anxiety and so forth. Um, but I was committed to studying this and making sure all of these horrific details were in the book because I never wanted to hear anyone ever say, oh, well, those people deserved it, or those people were asking for it. I wanted readers to know how horrific it is, it was, so they can only condemn it, what happened. Um, let me think. So during this time, I would, um, I often felt compelled also to meet descendants of victims of the, of the crime, uh, victims of, of the massacre, 17 very young children were spared the slaughter. And we can talk about that when we get into the story. But descendants of those 17 children, as well as children of um, victims who, didn't, who weren't in the mag uh, wagon train. And I would go down to Rick's office and I would say, I just, I really feel compelled to meet descendants of victims. And I'd say that several times. And, he, and then once he said, well, the direct descendant of Alexander Fancher and the direct descendant of John Twitty Baker, two of the leaders of the train, they're coming up to meet with Elder Jensen next week. You can say hi to them after that meeting. So they met with Elder Jensen. I'm not sure what about to this day, but I was waiting outside his office. And as soon as they stepped outside, I grabbed their hands and I said, I, I want you to know your ancestors were good people they did not deserve what happened to them. And I was so sorry. And I was stunned at their reaction. They just immediately started crying, which made me start crying. And then they grabbed me and we were standing there by the elevators hugging in the hallway. Um, make a long story short, they invited me out to Arkansas 
and for a reenactment or a reunion of all of the descendants of the wagon train members gathering at Beller Spring, Arkansas, where they had left in April 1857. So this was in April 2007. I went out, met all these folks, and uh, when when they met me, they'd say, okay, well, who do you descend from? And I said, well, no, and I'm just a Mormon from Utah. <laughs> <laughs> and people's eyes would get really big. They were surprised I was there, wondering what on earth I was doing there. Um, I, I became friends with all these folks eventually, and later they told me that it was spreading through this reunion. There's a Mormon spy from Utah over there, don't talk to her. <laughs> um, we, we laugh about that now, but um, I listened to their anger. A lot of them were very, very angry um, and very hurt and upset. But because I was studying this subject and I was angry about it, I was hurt, I was upset, I was able to sit with their anger and just listen. Um, because I didn't identify with the Mormon militiamen who carried out the massacre, I identified with the immigrant women, the mothers of young children who were just trying to protect their children were not unable to. So I just listened to their anger and uh, some of them invited me over to their house that night for dinner. We all sat and talked. We talked about things that needed to change. And I just said, what, what can we do for you? What can I do for you as descendants of victims? And there were two things that they wanted. Uh, they wanted the story told. They wanted the truth about their ancestors told, and they wanted their ancestors to never be forgotten. And then they wanted the mountain meadows, the valley in southwestern Utah, where the remains of their ancestors are buried. They wanted that land protected in perpetuity to make sure, you know, development didn't happen, to make sure there wasn't vandalism, to make sure it was just protected and honored and respected. So I go back to, to Utah and start talking with Elder Jensen and Rick Turley and just sharing experiences. To make a long story short, we had a series of exchanges. We would fly back to Arkansas and meet folks. They would fly to Salt Lake City and talk with us. Um, in 2007, there was a 150th commemoration at the Mountain Meadows. Um, just lots of exchanges and a lot of us just saying we're sorry and just owning what had happened and, and trying to do everything that we could to preserve the, their ancestors' memory. Eventually, uh, all of the descendants groups led by the Mountain Meadows Monument Foundation, they proposed that we seek National Historic Landmark status for the Mountain Meadows. So we did that, worked together. We all went to Washington, D.C. to uh, argue for this proposal before the committee. It was approved right there. We all went into the hallways. We're hugging and just celebrating that this was accomplished. So to make a long story short, I was finally healed. I didn't know this would heal me, but I was healed from those PTSD-like symptoms when I started reaching out to descendants of victims and just telling them I was sorry. I think because I realized there was something I could do for the victims. I couldn't get in a time machine and change what had happened. But what I could do for those victims was to reach out to their descendants and, the, and again, preserve their memory. So that's why uh, the books, that's why I speak about Matt Meadows to anyone who invites me everywhere I can. And um, I will always be telling this story and seeking reconciliation and healing. And then just a final chapter on this. After all of these reconciliation efforts, after we... Book one was published in 2008 after we achieved National Historic Landmark status several years into um, co-authoring with Rick Turley, Vengeance is Mine, I was looking at my family history and I saw a name there that I recognized because it appeared, it was an unusual name. It was the last name of Holly, H-A-W-L-E-Y. I looked in the index of Massacre at Mount Meadows it directed me to an appendix of the militiamen who participated, and I saw my ancestor's name there. So I discovered after all of this, I was a descendant of a perpetrator of the Mountain Meadows Massacre, like my hero in Juanita Brooks. Hmm. So, What did that mean for you? 
Uh, it was surreal, not only just to, and, and Rebecca has had a similar experience, I'm sure we'll talk about that. <laughs> it was surreal to discover that uh, I had an ancestor involved in something so heinous. But the, the added layer on top of that was that I had felt so compelled, A, to take this job, so compelled to meet descendants of victims, not knowing why, and that I, that I just happened to fall into this. Um, so th that was surreal. Um, and so I, I, I think I'm glad now to know that because I have a lot of people reach out to me after reading our books who also have discovered they're a descendant of a perpetrator or have always known they're a descendant of a perpetrator. And I can reach out to them and say, I, you know, I know how that feels. I know what that's like. And they say, what do we do? How do, how do, I, how do I deal with this? And I'll just encourage them, reach out and say you're sorry. That's all we can do, you know, is just own it and, and say sorry. So, um, oh, and then I forgot to add to, uh, after the first book came out, I loved the historical research so much. I decided I didn't want to just edit historians. I wanted to be a historian. So I went back to graduate school and got a master's degree in American history from the University of Utah. And then after that, I started, um, well, while I was doing that, I was co-authoring this book with Rick Turley. Beautiful. Rebecca, I'm curious if you have anything you want to <laughs> ask or say, but I do want to just quickly ask one question. Sure. I hope I didn't miss this, but th there was something around, I believe, Elder Iring or President Iring yes. and some sort of mm -hmm. apology, mm -hmm. or I don't know if it's right to call it an apology, but there's this perception that the church doesn't apologize, but, but some maybe perceived that an apology yeah. sort of happened? Is so there anything I, worth saying about yeah, that? Yeah, I was there in 2007 uh, when Elder Iring, he was not a member of the, of the First Presidency yet, but Elder Iring was there, and he read uh, the statement of regret. For me, sitting in the audience, and he was uh, crying as he read it, for me, sitting in the audience, I felt like this is an apology. I do also acknowledge though the viewpoint, some people feel like it didn't go far enough. Um, I, I recognize that viewpoint. Afterwards, the media uh, ran up and was asking Rick Turley, who was also there, was that an apology? And Rick said, it was meant as an apology. This, we're, the church is very sorry that this happened. And what I think though also is actions speak louder than words. And I have seen the church um, do all that it can to uh, acquire additional land at the Mountain Meadows, spending a lot of money to acquire additional lands and then add that to the National Historic Landmark designation to make sure that this land is protected always. And also working with descendants groups, having descendants write um, texts for monuments that have been added there, working with the descendants to say, what, what more can we do to preserve the meadows? To me, actions speak louder than words, and those actions certainly have been apologetic and uh, wanting to do the right thing by, by these people. That's great. Rebecca, anything you want to ask or comment on? Yeah, I think I, I would say that I, Barbara and I have really bonded on this whole issue. My story, I'll tell it extremely quickly because I know we need to get to the big story. But um, when I was working at the BYU library, um, hence running book clubs, um, as probably a late 20s, I was doing a reclassification project of old Mormon books. And as you're looking through to catalog them, you look in the index, and I found my founding Mormon ancestor's name there. And so excitedly, I looked into the book. What's his name? Or can you say? Uh, Ira Allen. Alan. Okay. Probably a lot of, maybe some of your viewers are related. I've run across people. Anyway, he was my founding ancestor. And I, to this point, I had only heard amazing things about a pioneer heritage and a pioneer ancestor. And as I started to read through these books and look at his name and what he'd done, um, he was one of the militia. He was a lieutenant in the militia. He was on the high council that made the decision um, to, you know, put these plans in action. So that changed everything for me. It's hard to explain how I felt, but it absolutely changed in everything. No one in my family had ever told me this. Um, I had never heard this from anyone. And so I, of course, being a little researcher myself, I made a lot of copies of things and, and information. And I took it to a family reunion. And I was basically told, 
no, <laughs> we don't want to know about that. That's not our narrative for our ancestor. And so I had to kind of wrestle with it alone for a long time and try to figure out how my ancestor, who was a nice, normal person, I assume, walking around in Connecticut in 1847, 10 years later, having joined the Mormon church, suddenly was somebody that could commit such, such an atrocity. And so I just struggled with that for a while. And I was very interested in the 2007 push to research and find out what had happened. There was um, an Ensign article that came out. I actually have a copy of it right here. I didn't realize it was written by Richard Turley, but it was. And I, I wanted to see how the church, what was their explanation? You know, what had happened to my ancestor? I vacillated back and forth between being really angry at him and also mm -hmm. then seeing him himself as a victim. And I wanted to know more. So the article, to me, I think it's it's a former narrative that your book almost puts to rest completely because it said this was the action of a rogue high council <laughs> in Cedar City, you know, that just kind of decided to do this because of some things they believed about the wagon train. So at that point, I had to just kind of distance myself from the story because I thought, all right, the blame is on my ancestor. Um, I don't really want to take this on or think about it anymore. But it's still always been in the background um, of, of different things. And I've, I've done it and read different books. And I've also visited the Mountain Meadows site. I made little rocks where I wrote, I'm so sorry, um, great, great, great granddaughter of a perpetrator. And I left them around on the site. And I also ran into descendants of survivors. And there was, there was one particular time that was on the anniversary and I'd taken a book club group there to the site and they were also having, the survivors um, of descend, descendants of survivors were also having a meeting there as they always do on the anniversary. And a woman came up to our group and I was leading the group. She said, oh, are you family? And I just broke down and I said, I'm sorry, I'm not family. I'm the other side. I'm the perpetrator. And like Barbara's experience, she hugged me. She said, it's okay. It's all right. We're going to work through all of this and we're going to do what's best for the memory mm -hmm. and, and to preserve the memory of, of these Beautiful. wonderful people. So to me, that was very healing. There mm -hmm. is a lot of healing because there's a lot of tragedy. Mm -hmm. So I just think it's important at this point that we dive into the story that Barbara can tell us because I, I feel like a lot of your viewers and listeners may not really be aware. It's something that's not, as I found out from my family, not discussed. I mean, mm -hmm. there is a lot of secrecy about it, and yeah. the important thing is to shine a light on of it, That's and right. let's deal with it, and let's yeah. have healing begin. So I think we just dive right in. Tell us what we need to know, Barbara. <laughs> sure. Mountain <laughs> Meadows Mal Mal Massacre in an hour. Go. Yeah, in an hour. Ready, go. <laughs> <laughs> well, first, just let me say I 100% agree with you, Rebecca, and um, my co-author, Rick, and I often say none of us alive today is responsible for mm -hmm. the massacre, but we are all responsible for how we deal with it. And so if we seek to try and cover it up or justify or or excuse it. Um, that's not the right way to handle it. The right way is to, like you say, um, shine sunshine on it, make it so it's not a taboo topic, so it's safe to talk about now, and and then own it and apologize, and then we can seek healing and rest, reconciliation and peace. Beautiful. So. Let's do it. Okay, so how could this thing happen? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so in 1857, a newly elected president named James Buchanan has heard rumors from Utah Territory, where the Latter-day Saints have been living for 10 years. They started colonizing the territory uh, in 1847. He hears rumors from uh, federal officials, federal appointees who had been in Utah. They go back to Washington, D.C., and they say, we've got a problem out in Utah. We have a growing theocracy. Brigham Young was not only the president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, he was also the governor of Utah Territory and superintendent of Indian Affairs was the title. Um, so we've got a growing theocracy in the West. They're practicing polygamy. They are forming alliances with Native Americans and uh, apostates. And Gentiles are not safe in the territory. So Buchanan starts hearing these kinds of rumors. And then at the same time, the Utah Territorial Legislature in January 1857, they're fed up with the federal appointees that are be being sent to the territory. So territories at the time were like colonies. They did not have the right to elect their many of their officials or their judges. They were appointed in the East and sent out to these territories or basically colonies to rule. And so the Latter-day Saint legislature 
which was all Latter-day Saints, and they were locally elected, they send this scathing petition or memorial back to Washington, D.C., saying, we're sick of the judges and the people you're sending here. We don't like them. And if they don't seek to identify with us, we will send them away. For our Never Mormons, <laughs> will you do 30 seconds on sure. what made them the LDS folk particularly hostile towards the federal government in terms of its history, just Abs real quick. Sure, absolutely. Um, so in the 1830s and 1840s, the Latter-day Saints had been violently driven from Missouri and Illinois. That's why they came out to the Great Basin and what became Utah a few years later, because they were getting away from the United States. They, were, they, they loved the Constitution, but they thought the United States had gone astray, and they were bitterly anti-government, anti military because militia units had been used to drive them out and uh, they had received no protection from the federal government in spite of their petitions so they felt that they could get no peace no protection no respite in the united states so they head to the west in what was mexico in the 1840s but after the uh, uh, mexican american war it becomes part of the U.S. and shortly thereafter, the territory of Utah is created. And I mean, the church's founder Joseph Smith was murdered, and and the yes. church felt what about that? Yeah. Generally? So so Joseph Smith and his brother Hiram were assassinated in 1844, and again, no um, no one was convicted for that crime. And again, they just felt like the United States was not there to protect them, and and the United States had killed their their best men. Yeah. Okay. So they were bitter. Yeah. As they left. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's kind of their mindset coming from the Utah side of it. So with that background, when Brigham Young and other church leaders hear word that the newly elected president has sent an army to Utah to occupy their settlements, they freak out because of their prior experience. Um, they also hear that Brigham Young is going to be replaced as the territorial governor. Young says, okay, the new federal appointees, they can come in. That's fine. We'll let them in but the troops must not enter. And he says, I feel to be oppressed no more. They are not going to be driven from their homes again. So never again, never again. And they weren't, <laughs> they haven't been. Um, so they developed strategies, resistance strategies against these approaching troops. And their plan is to try and get stall the troops on the plane that uh, year. And if they can get them stalled on the planes through the winter, Congress will meet and then they hope that they, to win public opinion and that Congress will say, look, why are you sending troops against our own people? And they're hoping that Congress will rein in the president and, and encourage Buchanan to pull the troops back. So that's exactly what they do. Um, many Latter-day Saints might know the, sto the famous stories of Lot Smith and the Mormon militia who opposed the troops on the plains. They burned grass um, in front of the approaching troops so that their animals would, animals would starve to death and not be able to progress. They uh, burned government supply trains, so on and so forth, in what became known as the Utah War. We don't think of our ancestors, pioneer ancestors, like burning bush so that <laughs> cattle will die and yeah. burning wagon trains, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is, I mean, some people hear of this, others have never hear about this. Yeah. You know, we just think, oh, just, just a peace loving people. So, um, yeah. but, but Brigham Young, again, he's, he's telling these militiamen, don't kill anyone, just harass them and keep them <laughs> stalled on the plains. And he says, and we, we quote him in this book, he says, we want to win public opinion abroad. We want to win over the rest of the country and Congress so that they'll pull, so that they'll convince the president to pull back the troops. But let's stall them on the plane so they can't come in, and then they will have to spend the winter. Back then, there was so much snow, and you're on horseback and in wagons, you can't progress into the settlements in that kind of snow. So that's exactly what happens. They get stalled near um, the burned out remains of Fort Bridger in what is today Wyoming, and they do spend the winter on the plains, which makes the troops super upset. <laughs> they're growing in their anger against the Latter-day Saints. Um, so that's what they're doing outside of the territory. Then within the territory, they're encouraging Mormons to prepare for a siege. They're saying, save your ammunition, save your guns, save your grain, don't sell any grain or food to passing immigrants. We need to cash it and hoard it and prepare for a possible siege if the troops do make it in. And then there's another strategy that came out 
more strongly in volume two when we started looking at the aftermath of the Mount Meadows massacre. Young and his advisors and his interpreters to Native American tribes uh, who speak Native American languages, they start encouraging uh, local tribes to raid emigrant cattle companies, to steal their cattle, run off their cattle. Okay, why? <laughs> so another strategy that, that Young comes up with is he says, okay, We've always, the, by the Mormons being here in the Great Basin, through which all of the trails to the West Coast pass, if, if we can convince the federal government that our staying here keeps these trails safe and open for emigration, then maybe they won't drive us. And if we can convince that sending troops here is, um, instigates a warlike uh, hysteria, then maybe they'll pull the troops back because he says, Indians, and again, he's playing on racial stereotypes that we don't agree with, but this is, this is what uh, the stereotypes were at the time. He's saying all hell is going to break loose if war breaks out here. And if, if the Latter-day Saints aren't here, and if we're not holding the Indians back, they're going to start raiding all these cattle companies. And so he says, keep the troops out, and then we can go back to our peaceful ways before emigration can continue safely. But if you keep sending the troops... These raids are going to happen. So that's what he's saying publicly. Privately, he and his interpreters are encouraging local tribes to engage in raiding cattle companies. Uh, he also is trying to befriend and win the friendship of the local tribes in uh, fighting against the troops should they make it into the territory. So they are using them. Um, so many of the uh, local natives say, no, we're not going to engage in that. We'll just go up in the, we'll go up in the hills and <laughs> let the two of you fight it out. And then we'll just, you know, make friends with the winner. Um, and others are saying, but you've always told us not to steal, not to, to raid and take immigrant cattle. And the interpreter says, so I have, but now the Americans have come to fight us and things are different right now. So this was a wartime strategy. So what we found is that between September 7th and October 3rd, 1857, there were several raids by Native Americans led by Mormon interpreters, white Mormon interpreters, um, that are carried out throughout the territory from what is now the border of Utah and Idaho all the way down to what is now Nevada. Several raids on several different wagon trains uh, and only one of them led to a massacre when something went awry. Okay. You, I only want you to talk about this in the sequence that you feel comfortable. Okay. One of our viewers, Brendan Lee, has asked if mm. it's worth mentioning the Mormon Reformation Absolutely. And, its, and its influence, but, yep. but only at the point you think it makes sense. Let's talk about it now. So, so you have that going on. You have war. You have a conflict going on between Utah and the federal government. You have that going on. And then also in 1856 and 1857 in the church, you have something called the Mormon Reformation. So beginning in 1856, Brigham Young and other church leaders, primarily Jedediah M. Grant, who was uh, an apostle, they feel that Latter-day Saints aren't as devout as they used to be. They're not um, as active in paying their tithing and um, as dedicated as they once were. And so these leaders feel like they need to preach some really strong sermons with um, some strong rhetoric, some of it very violent, to kind of like wake up the people to their duty. So that is going on, and it's, it's violent rhetoric. So you have that, you have the war hysteria, um, and you have all of these things that come together at the same time. So I'm, thank you for bringing that up. And then one of the doctrines that's being uh, preached at this time as part of the Mormon Reformation is, is blood atonement. And so many people have, have, have heard of blood atonement. Some haven't today. But it was a doctrine that uh, Brigham Young and others taught that the atonement, the atoning blood of Jesus Christ is not enough to atone for all sins, namely very serious sins such as murder and repeated adultery. And so this doctrine said that if somebody committed one of those heinous sins, if they wanted to go to the highest degree of heaven or the celestial kingdom, they had to also offer up their own blood. 
and that could absolve them of these serious crimes. So they could go to a church leader and say, I'm offering myself up, and then that person could be blood atoned. So it's a very, uh, it, we quote Brigham Young's statements about it in the book. It's very disturbing, very grim, very violent language. We, uh, in the book, we share a couple of examples that we found of blood atonement. Uh, one is a man from Harmony, an unidentified man from Harmony. And I don't know if Brendan Lee is a descendant of John D. Lee or not. But This is in southern Utah, this is in Cedar southern City Utah. kind of ish area. Yeah, is that right? Cedar Harmony. City, Harmony. So Isaac Haight, who is the stake president and militia major in Cedar City, he writes Brigham Young in 1857, early 1857 and said, A man from Harmony, he doesn't identify him. Perhaps it was John D. Lee. We just don't know because John D. Lee lived in Harmony. Um, a man from Harmony has come to me and he has confessed to having sex with one of his wives before they were married. And he says if he feels he is willing to give up his life to atone for that sin if you feel like it is necessary. So Isaac Haight writes Brigham Young and asks about it. Young writes back and says, no, just tell the man, to, you know, if, he, if he, he's married the woman now, he says, tell him to repent and sin no more. Uh, there's another instance in which Isaac Haight writes Brigham Young and he tells of another man named Rasmus Anderson who has been um, having sexual relations, we don't know, he says connection, with a young girl who is his stepdaughter. And so the, the young girl, ironically, I don't know why she needed to repent, but um, anyways, the, the girl and Rasmus Anderson, they stand before the congregation, they repent of their sin, and then Hate and Bishop Philip Klingensmith of Cedar City say, okay, don't do this again, or you know what it could lead to. Several years later, they're both caught uh, having sex again outside of marriage. And so Hate writes Brigham Young, and he says, I sent him to California, which was a euphemism for we had him killed. Mm. And uh, Brigham Young... You're pretty Young, sure that's what happened, that he was killed? Yes, because there are other accounts that um, say that Klingon Smith and a couple of other men from Cedar City take Rasmus Anderson because he said, okay, I'm, will, I'm, I'm here to offer up my life to atone for my sins. They take him, they dig a hole, they slit his throat, mm. let him bleed into the hole and then bury him. And again, so that was kind of a later reminiscent account, but because of this letter that Isaac Haight is writing and mentioning him by name, we, knew, we know that this did happen. Young writes back nothing about the man. He doesn't say anything about the man in his letter, but he, he gives advice about the girl and says, you know, let her be, she's 16 by then and, and uh, basically says, forgive her and let her be married. It's hard so to imagine. You know what happened. Okay. <laughs> Blood atonement happened. And it's hard um, to imagine this would be the only incident. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the Mountain Meadows Massacre, and we'll get into it, but the Mountain Meadows Massacre is not an incident of blood atonement. But the fact that Isaac Haight, who is the man who orders it, carries out this very violent act in August of 1857, shortly before the Mountain Meadows Massacre, shows kind of a violent mindset. You know, that violence can be the answer, if that makes sense. In the Book of Mormon, so with the story about Nephi and Laban sure. kind of sets yeah, a precedent. I mean, there's lots right? of violence in the Book of Mormon, yeah. that's for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So I hope that kind of lays yeah. the groundwork or Very the good. context of yeah. what's going on in 1857. And again, uh, readers can go yeah. into the detail and see all of our sources yeah. that we have for this. So that's the context. Um, so the initial attack on the company at the Mountain Meadows takes place in the early morning of September 7th, 1857, and it goes awry. Instead of just running off their cattle herd, several immigrants are killed during the attack, 
and uh, they quickly circle their wagons and they dig in. They're 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 preparing. You know, you hear the expression "circling their circle your wagons." They circle their wagons, making kind of a wagon fort, is what they called it. And they're um, coming from Arkansas, going to they, California, yes, correct? Yes, and we we do talk a lot about the immigrants themselves too. We want to name them by name and tell their stories as well. And again, they're in the book, so people can learn more about them. How important was the Parley P. Pratt? murder yeah. as it related to the hysteria about the, yeah. the party. So absolutely. Let's talk okay. about Pratt in just a minute. Okay, yeah. but, but yes, Sorry. we were. Okay. I do want to get into that. Yes. Let's get into that as well. Okay. Yeah. When, when so, to start for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we'll just do it chronologically. Okay. Yeah. Good. <laughs> so um, two militiamen who see this happen, they're like, oh crap, this didn't go as planned. And several people have been killed now. And so two of these militiamen, they're named Joel White and Bill Stewart, they start riding back to Cedar City to report to Isaac Haight what has happened. On their way back, they come across two emigrant men several miles back who did not know that this attack had happened. They were riding behind the wagon train and gathering up loose cattle to bring them into the main herd. So these two militiamen encounter these two emigrant men, and they make the horrible decision that they need to contain the situation. And so they decide to kill these two emigrant men. They fire on both of them. They kill one. His name was William Aiden. The other man, we don't know his name, but he got away. And so he starts, he puts spurs to his horse, and he starts riding back to the Mount Meadows, riding to his wagon train where he, he doesn't realize they're under siege. And the two militiamen, they follow him. Make a long story short, the Latter-day Saint attackers see him get inside the corral. And now, all of a sudden, everybody inside that wagon corral are witnesses to the fact that white Latter-day Saints are involved in these wagon, uh, in these cattle raids. And also some of them have been, some of these immigrants have been murdered now at this point. So then the Latter-day Saints are thinking, oh my goodness, what do we do? And the local leaders make a horrendous decision that they need to wipe out all of these witnesses, except for the youngest children who, quote, are too young to tell tales. So um, they murder all of the people by, by treacherous, by treachery. They, um, John D. Lee and a man named William Bateman carry a white flag out, um, signaling that they're there to rescue these immigrants inside. Isaac Haight receives permission from the militia commander of Iron County. His name is William Dame. He lives at Parowan, Utah. He is also the state president at Parowan. Haight receives permission from Dame to call out more militiamen. They send them all out on Thursday night. They get there. Um, Rebecca's ancestor... Ira Allen was on the high council. He's there. They have a discussion and they say, this is what we're going to do. We're going to decoy them out. We're going to tell them that we're here to rescue them. We're going to leave them out of the, of their safety, of their bulwark of wagons. And then we're going to slaughter them except for the youngest children. So they're all uh, massacred except for 17 children aged six and under. Most of them were toddlers and babies. So that's how young the kids were that they spared, very, very young children. Um, is it worth, I mean, I'm not trying to be graphic, is it worth talking about how the, yeah, or not? Is it better to just leave uh, that to well, the, book? the book? The okay. book is yeah. very graphic. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like, again, um, it's not just, just, like, guns. just like book one, yeah. um, I just wanted to make sure that I put in every single graphic detail not to be salacious, but for readers to understand how hideous this crime was. And in fact, I've, I always have people who've read the book talk to me, come up to me, and they'll say, and descendants of victims and descendants of perpetrators or just others, say, I have to read a chapter, put it down, read another chapter, put it down, um, not to discourage anyone from reading it, but yeah, those initial chapters are are very detailed. Um, but yeah, they're, they're massacred in hideous ways. It's, it's horrific. Um, so what happens? So there's another wagon train, uh, 
It's a combined group of trains called the Turner Dukes Collins train or just the Dukes train. And they come under attack. They are negotiate with the local bishop, Philo T. Farnsworth, and a, a Native American um, named Ammon. And they say, okay, well, just turn over some of your cattle and then you can go. But they keep getting attacked and they, the cattle keeps gained, getting raided. None of them are killed, but they're right on the heels of this company from Arkansas. And the Turner Dukes Collins train, they are from Texas, Arkansas, and Oklahoma. So those who are from Arkansas, they know the people in the train ahead of them. They know who they are because they're friends. So once they um, get to California, they start reporting the news. They say there's this massacre that's taken place. It was committed by uh, Mormons and Indians. I'm, I'm always careful because some of those uh, Native people were baptized Mormons, likely, who, who participated. So white Mormons and Natives, and they say Mormons are involved in this. It's not just an Indian massacre, as the Mormons want everybody to think. And so the editors in California, newspaper editors, they're trying to look for a motive. Why would Latter-day Saints be involved in massacring? Why? What's the motive? And so an editor comes up with the theory, ha, huh, there was a Mormon apostle named Parley P. Pratt who was murdered in northwest Arkansas at Fort Smith in May of 1857. They must have killed all of these people because they're from Arkansas in uh, retribution or as a matter of vengeance. So that's the theory that a newspaper man in California shares. It gets picked up and that theory still exists today. We didn't find any evidence of that from the perpetrators hmm. themselves. The perpetrators themselves give myriad excuses and motivations, but the, the one that's common with all of them is that this was a cover up, that they had to wipe out witnesses. Not one of them says that the murder of Parley P. Pratt was a motive for them. So. That's, that's what our research found. Also, um, the thing with Pratt's murder is he was murdered by a man named Hector McLean from San Francisco. And he was chasing Parley across the country because Parley had, Hector was an abusive husband and his wife named Eleanor McLean left Hector to become Parley's plural wife. She joined the church, became a plural wife of Parley. Hector McLean was angry about that, chased Parley across the country, finally catches up with him in Arkansas, but he wasn't even in Arkansas who killed Parley P. Pratt. So yeah, that motivation just kind of doesn't stand up to uh, the historical documentation. So. Okay. Um, I could ask the question, perhaps, um, this is a new narrative, I think, to a lot of people, the politically motivated, politically mm -hmm. driven, the strategy, which makes sense to show, mm -hmm. you know, the power of Brigham Young and the church mm -hmm. in the area. Mm -hmm. So along with Parley P. Pratt, there were many other things that I heard, you know, reasons, and all of them were sort of blaming the baker Francher party, right? Mm -hmm. Can you talk about some of those, yeah. oh, the poisoning of the grain, or they're fighting with people in town, and in preparation for... for we're talking to you today, I even looked through those motivations, which I think now are incorrect based on what you've learned with the new research and the new documents, those still exist, for example, in Turley's article in 2007 in the Ensign, those still exist even in the gospel topic essays. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that that yeah. can be updated because, you know, there was a lot of rumor, there was a lot of innuendo, mm -hmm. like you said, the Joseph Smith gun, the Parley P. Pratt, the poison of the grain. Maybe talk just a little bit about that, and and have we put all those to rest? That that is no longer the case. This yeah. is brand new. What you found in your book, so that's, that's a, very important. Yeah, that's a great question. So, Massacre at Mountain Meadows came out in two thousand and eight, and again, that that what that um, the narrative of that book only goes up to essentially right after the massacre. So it only goes up to right at, at eighteen fifty seven. Now we do know that there was conflict. There was some conflict caused by this tension by. Um, Local people, instead of selling grain to immigrants, they're keeping it, they're hoarding it for themselves because of, you know, the right. siege mentality, of course. So we do have some contemporary sources that talk about there was some conflict. But studying the aftermath of the Mountain Meadows Massacre 
led to new discoveries. And that's kind of the nature of the historical craft. The more you study something or the dig deeper you dig or a different period you study, it always brings new insights and it hopefully should. And so this, uh, this strategy of encouraging cattle rating, that came out as we're studying the aftermath and seeing, wait a minute, there's all these other attacks happening as late as October 3rd, 1857 for example. Um, and then looking at those stories of, of conflict between these emigrants and local people, I started to see that a lot of those accounts came later. They, those were in the aftermath. Again, so studying the aftermath and then watching how those rumors grew over time while looking at the aftermath, I started to see, we started to see that uh, these a lot of these came later and they're perpetrate they're they're shared by perpetrators who are seeking to blame the victims or victim blame for to as an excuse for the crime that they had committed so they're growing stories about victim blaming and so it's been very important to us to put those rumors to rest and very important to descendants of victims um so one example and actually this came out in book one but we also talk about it in book two vengeance is mine um there were a lot of people who died from some kind of mysterious illness at corn creek which is where these arkansas immigrants had encamped and after they pass through uh they leave an ox that had died and they say well we'll give this to the indians to eat the local um, pavan indians and so they eat that some local Indians die. A local boy named Proctor Robinson dies. Um, a woman who is also skinning the the these uh, uh, cattle. She becomes very ill. Uh, there's very there's detailed descriptions of all these illnesses. Now the people in 1850s they have no understanding of microbes and germ theory in 1850s yet. And so they say, oh, well, these people must have poisoned this ox. They must have poisoned the springs. What we did is we took uh, uh, all of these symptoms that are listed in these historical sources, shared them independently with a panel of doctors. They all independently looked at these symptoms. And then we met with them. They all came back and they said, this looks like anthrax, all of them. Um, anthrax is a disease passed through spores uh, that can pass from cattle to humans. And so we say that this mysterious disease, in fact, was not poisoning, but was anthrax. So that's just the kind of work we, we did to debunk um, these rumors and really show that these people were um, just in the wrong place at the wrong time and uh, were innocent, completely innocent. I think yeah. it's also important to talk about the wealth of this wagon train. I don't mm -hmm. think people recognize this, you know, that they'd mm -hmm. made this trip several times. They had, they were, my ancestor, just a day or so after the attack was uh, one of the ones that was overseeing rebranding the cattle with the church's brand, you know, so that it could. Uh, uh, yeah, it was actually, they were rebranded with John D. Lee's brand. That's right. The brand right there. John yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I know that my ancestor supposedly was given a wagon and then, you yes. know, sent somewhere else. So, so uh, some people feel that maybe the wealth of the wagon sure. train was yeah. a motivation. Mm -hmm. They certainly did take advantage after the fact of, you know, all the cattle and everything they had. So Absolutely. did that play at all into it and what yeah. you found? Because that's a legitimate question I think mm -hmm. people would ask. Yeah. So all of the um, cattle and and back then, wealth was in cattle, yes. primarily. So all of the cattle end up on uh, the Harmony Range near mm -hmm. John D. Lee's home. And he said that he kept those cattle for the Indians um, and said if any of them came to him, he would turn over cattle to them. Uh, they are branded with his brand. Um, and then, yeah, so the wagons, that would be like getting a car at the time. Your, yes, your ancestor, Ira yeah. Allen, did did end up with one of the wagons that, that we found historical evidence of that. So some of the leaders got wagons, and then they, um, some of the leaders of the massacre looted the bodies and took, you know, watches, things like that. So absolutely. Um, but, yeah, primarily the wealth was in, was in cattle. And so when John D. Lee goes up to report the massacre, they wait for almost two weeks, or more than two weeks, almost three weeks. And when, when John D. Lee goes up to report the massacre to Brigham Young, he lies to Young and he tells them that the Indians took all of the property and that the massacre was committed only by Indians. He so, lies to Brigham Young. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so then, but then when Lee comes back, he says, he tells all the local people, oh, Brigham Young told me to keep all the cattle on my range. Mm. So yeah, but absolutely wealth seemed to be a... So I mean, the, the well, I guess there's so many places we could go. Um, let me just sure. say really quickly, <laughs> we did get one question that I wanted to ask just because it's a bit timely. I think it's also could be a decent segue whenever you're ready to talk about what happened to the surviving children, because I think sure. that's an important part of the story. But mm -hmm. somebody basically, you know, Jesse Nashville James writes, if it wasn't blood atonement, then why were children under eight years old put in a wagon and saved? He basically believes that the fact that Mormon children under the eight being saved indicates or suggests that blood atonement informed this practice because mm -hmm. I believe part of the blood atonement slash Mormon doctrine sure. is that mm -hmm. kids under that eight is the age of accountability. Mm -hmm. And so the kids weren't accountable. Any yeah, absolutely. That's, that is a theory that's been out there for many years. What we found, what, what the historical research showed was that some babies were killed. Some, um, children, uh, age seven and younger were killed. And, uh, so it just doesn't stack up to, the research, the documentation. So the oldest, there was two six-year-olds who were spared, one five-year-old, one four-year-old, and the rest were aged two and under. So it just doesn't, because there were children who were younger than eight who were also murdered, it just doesn't um, um, stack up. And also, again, um, the, the historical sources, the perpetrators, when they talk about who was spared, why those children were spared. Every single one of them said the children who were too young to tell tales were the words that they used. So mm. I don't think the historical documentation supports that. Okay. I think um, as our book club was reading the book and of course chatting back and forth online, I think of course the big question everybody always wants to know is about Brigham Young and his mm -hmm. role. And you know, like you said, Isaac Hake always writing letters back to Brigham Young. In this case, mm -hmm. he did the same thing, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and people have brought up, well, here's a climate um, that exists in Utah where they felt the need to ask, you know, yeah, absolutely. should we murder these people? Sure. So mm -hmm. it is the big question and it's mm -hmm. a very complicated answer, I know. Mm -hmm. But if you can just talk a little bit about that, I think that's what everybody wants to know. You know, Brigham Young, what right. was his role? And also another question, and I think I asked you this before when I interview you, had you discovered some things that were extremely unfavorable about Brigham Young's involvement in the book, would you have included it? I mean, oh, that's what you would have had yeah. to as I a mean, historian. That's, yeah, I'm, yep. a, I'm a professional historian and, exactly. and um, I'm true to my craft mm -hmm. and true to historical sources. And yeah, um, yeah in fact, I, sometimes I say, yeah, I would love if, if there was historical documentation, I would love to be the, the one to say, <laughs> yeah, he did order, you know. Yep. Um, <laughs> uh, but but that's just not what the, the historical documentation bears out. The, and again, the Brigham that's, Young directed that, it. That he right. ordered a massacre. Right. You know, what we did find is he was encouraging this cattle raiding. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, there are a few things to me that um, uh, provide additional evidence that he didn't order the massacre. One, of course, is the the letter. So Isaac Haight on September 7th, once, once this uh, siege happens and the two militiamen make it back to Isaac Haight and they report, oh, we killed these immigrants. One of them got back in the wagon corral. Haight's like, ah, we're in a muddle. He sends a letter north to Brigham Young saying, oh, what should we do here? Young writes back on, he receives that letter from an express writer on September 10th. This was pre-telegraph. Um, he receives that letter. He writes a letter back saying, um, the Indians will do as they please, which again is this policy he's been preaching and writing and talking about. He says, but you must not meddle with them. If those who are there will go in peace, let them go. That letter arrives on September 13th in Cedar City. Now here's... It, it's it, two it, days Brigham, after the massacre. Yes, exactly. So that's one thing. Um, if if Brigham Young had ordered the massacre, then when Isaac Haight and William Dame of Parowan, they're the two armchair leaders. They don't go out to the massacre. They make sure that they're not there. They just tell other people to carry it out. But anyways, when they arrive in the early morning of September 12th and they see the carnage, they start arguing over who's going to take blame for this. And they start arguing. Um, Haight says... Dame says, oh, I've got to, we've got to report this to Governor Young, President Young. And Haight says, well, how are you going to report it? 
as an Indian massacre. And Dame says, oh, I'm not so sure I'd report it as an Indian massacre. I, maybe we need to tell the truth. And Dame says, if, if, you, if you tell the truth about this thing, then I will find you in hell. And so they are arguing vehemently over how they're going to report it, who's going to take blame for it, who's responsible for it. If Brigham Young had ordered it, they would just be, yeah, yeah, we did, yeah. We did what you know, Young told us to do. Um, and then also when, so they convinced... Unless they were protecting him. But... But, but again, they're just privately yeah, arguing. Right, they're yeah. privately arguing and um, militiamen are watching. They're, they're watching what's happening and yeah. we have their accounts of what they see happening. Okay. Um, uh, and then, so, so Haight and Dame, again, they're just ugh, armchair leaders. They, they want Lee to be the fall guy for this. So they tell John D. Lee, okay, you go up. You go up when you go up to general conference <laughs> and in the fall, in early October, late, late September. You go tell Brigham Young, you report him what happened. Tell him what happened and tell him this was an Indian massacre. And, and John D. Lee says to Haight, well, why don't you just write him about it? And Haight says, oh, you could tell him better than I. <laughs> so John D. Lee arrives in Brigham Young's office on September 29th, 1857. And Brigham Young, he, Lee asks for a private interview with Young, but Young says, uh, no, I want my assistant church historian, Wilford Woodruff, to come in the office with me. And so he has Wilford come in and Woodruff records mm. that day what Lee is saying. And that's why we know what Lee told Young and that he's lying to him. He says it was an all Indian massacre. He says the Indians took all of the um, property. And then he says, we just went out, we the militiamen, we just went out to, to bury the dead. And uh, Young and Woodruff believe him. And in fact, Young is so upset about what he's hear, heard. We know he leaves his office after that interview or maybe during that interview. And his clerk says he leaves the office feeling ill. He's sick. And he goes up into City Creek Canyon to kind of just decompress. Um, but after that point, Young never talks about his strategy. He never encourages cattle raiding anymore. We can't find a single incident of that. So perhaps, we don't know, we don't have a source for this, but uh, perhaps he thinks, did my policy lead to this? I'll yeah. just say one, and I'm going to just give a shout out to the book. Again, the book is Vengeance is Mine, The Mountain Meadows Massacre and Its Aftermath by Richard E. Turley and our guest today, Barbara Jones-Brown. Please pause and go buy this book right now on Amazon <laughs> or at Benchmark Books or wherever you get your books um, because we want to support uh, this book and make it a national bestseller more than it already is. But uh, I I will say that when I was listening and, and and again, the the audio narrator of of this audiobook, I think, does a great job. Mm -hmm. And when he's reciting some of the sermons that were given, both by Brigham yep. Young and others, it, regardless of whether Brigham Young directed it, and we've already mentioned this a little bit, the sermons that are being given at general conference or in local regional conferences throughout mm -hmm. Utah, they're not just kind of like aggressive to they're me violent. they're, they're mm -hmm. shockingly violent, violent and yes. apocalyptic mm -hmm. and that's pre yep. the massacre yep. so I, I i while we can't really pin it on brigham young if that rhetoric were being used today it's more extreme than let's Absolutely. just pick your worst politician today way worse than that yeah so i mean is it fair to say there's something 100 percent yeah 100 and that's that's our conclusion is is that um and it's this interestingly enough it's the same conclusion that juanita brooks came to um back in 1950 that that all of these things including this violent rhetoric by leaders created the the tinderbox conditions that just a single match would just yeah. cause us to blow okay. up so absolutely and of course um brigham young is responsible for encouraging this this cattle rating. Yes, it was a wartime strategy um, as a result of this conflict, but yes, he did he did encourage that. And did he intend for people to be murdered because of it? We don't find any evidence of that. We find evidence of him saying, we don't want a single blood to be spilled so that we can win public opinion, but ultimately we have a massacre. And so yes, um, yeah, church leaders definitely, and that rhetoric definitely plays a role okay. in what happened.
And, and that's kind of how I finally came to terms with my ancestor's involvement, that I had to look at the environment that he lived mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I would have to say, you know, he was just a horrible, horrible person. But there were so many other factors. Yeah. So learning more about that kind of helped me come to terms with his role in it. I think one thing to talk about that John brought up just a few minutes ago is the children, because of yeah. course they are the link to the survivors today. What did happen to the children? Yeah. It's tragic. Yep. It's wonderful that they lived and survived. And so, you know, their descendants are here. But yeah, I don't know if everyone knows exactly what happened then, because yeah. it was a long drawn out process to even return them to mm -hmm. where they belonged. Yeah. So maybe tell everyone yeah. about the children. And this is a very important part yes. of the aftermath story. So I'm glad you asked about that. So um, at, at the massacre scene, uh, <laughs> ironically, the Bishop of Cedar City named Philip Klingensmith, he gathers up the surviving children. They turn over some of the children that they deem to be too old, that they could talk, uh, to be murdered. They load uh, the surviving children who are screaming in their mother, in their dead mother's arms, or just wandering around. Wait, stumbling. did you see there's a sorting where yeah. they, they yeah. choose yeah. some this final kids to kill? Was, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. And again, this is one of the really grim details of the book. Um, they put them in the back of a wagon, and the wagon goes north to the ranch of Rachel Hamlin, a little shanty there. She and uh, one of the militiamen's wives named Carolyn Beck are both living there. They care for these screaming, blood-stained, traumatized children through that first night. Hmm. Uh, an adopted Indian son, a Shoshone son of Jacob and Rachel Hamlin named Albert says the children cried all night. It's really tough. And again, some of these babies are nursing babies. Um, the next day, uh, John D. Lee pretends that he's acting as an agent for the Indians, and he pretends like the Indians have earned these children, like the Indians that are there own these children. And so he trades goods. They give blankets and things for these children to, to local um, Native Americans. And Rachel Hamlin describes it as a sham. She argues that she wants to keep all three of the little Dunlap girls. One of the, the, the youngest has been shot through with a bullet through their arm. Her arm is just hanging there. And she says, you cannot move her. And then when her two older sisters beg to not be separated from their baby sister, Rachel stands up to John D. Lee and says, I'm keeping all three of them. And those were the only three children who were allowed to uh, remain together. The other children are divided up and um, spread throughout uh, different Mormon homes in Cedar City and Santa Clara, south of the Meadows. As newspaper reports start spreading across the nation in 1857, I talked about some of them coming out of California. Um, word reaches Arkansas, one of these articles, and a man named William C. Mitchell, who is the grandfather of one of these uh, children, he uh, learns about that there are surviving children, and so he starts writing to the Arkansas delegation asking for help, the federal government's help in finding and retrieving those children and bringing them back to their relatives in Arkansas. Uh, this is one of the saddest stories. William C. Mitchell knows that his grandbaby was a little baby, and so he's hoping to, that one of these children is his, his grandbaby. Um, when federal officials gather up the children and return them to Arkansas. He's so excited because he thinks one of these little babies is his, and it turns out it's not his grandbaby, and his grandbaby has been murdered. So again, that's that's one of the, the young children who was killed at Mountain Meadows. Um, so they're returned to their families in Arkansas, and uh, tragically, they're there when the Civil War breaks out, and many of their towns that they return to are burned to the ground these children should have been living in peace in California with their with their parents and families. Mm. But they go on to lead um, admirable lives and have families of their own. And we have now friends who are descendants of victims because of those children. Mm. One of the really disturbing parts for me was the when when John D. Lee returns back from visiting Brigham Young, mm -hmm. he's trying to manage the narrative probably along mm -hmm. with others. Yeah. There was, we've already talked about it a little bit, but there was like even theories being spread that like the women were sex workers and that's why they were killed. They were, that, Do you they talk were, about that they were rotten with the pox, 
which uh, is was 19th century parlance for venereal disease. Again, this is part of the horrific victim blaming that our book uh, debunks. We quote a forensic anthropologist who had later studied some of their bones and ruled out that absolutely. We didn't believe it in the first place, but yeah, the, the perpetrators just start saying horrific things about these people in order to, I think, assuage their own guilt. Hmm. Um, and to protect the church, baby. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's why I'd like to see this narrative, your narrative in this book, make it into uh, mm -hmm. mainstream church sources. Because like mm -hmm. I said, the Gospel Topics essay yeah. is more in line with, you know, there was something wrong with the people. Yeah, it has not blamed, updated. You know, yeah, mm -hmm. an yeah. updated um, article yeah. in the Liahona, something like that, you know, yeah. to let, let people understand. And it's part of yeah. the legacy yeah. of this, you know. Mm -hmm. wonderful people traveling across the country and yeah. fate. So I would like to see that, I hope. Yeah, so. I'd like to see that too. I, I no longer work for the church history department, yeah. but I, yeah. <laughs> if I, anyone I, out there. I'm with you, like, like, yeah, let's, we can encourage that. And again, I think the more I can, you know, Rick and I can talk mm -hmm. about this book and, mm -hmm. and have people read it, that we can disseminate that, that narrative, but... Right. Yeah, and let's, then, let's write letters. <laughs> let's write letters. Everyone yeah. write a letter. And then, yeah. of course, um, a lot of your book, um, unlike the first book, deals with the legal aftermath. Yes. There mm -hmm. was a lot, and mm -hmm. it was tied into the political system in Utah. Yes. It was tied into the yes. the fight for statehood. There was so much going on. And a polygamy. much bigger picture. <laughs> yeah. And polygamy, all of it. So yeah. I know we probably need another episode, John. Well, <laughs> well, I mean, I think whether or not Brigham... Uh, ordered it, I think the really big question that we should probably spend some time on is to what extent was Brigham Young and or others guilty of, of engaging in a cover-up? Right. So yeah, we'll, we'll, absolutely. Let's talk yeah. about that. Yeah, and so the book does go into the cover-up as well, because it, again, so book one ends essentially at 1857 mm -hmm. and says, there's going to be a second book that's going to talk about after, here's the second book, this is it. But follow um, whatever chronology you were planning, because mm -hmm. we, we don't want to short-circuit. Sure. Yeah. So, so in 1859, I mentioned that federal officials come south and they gather up these um, children and have them returned to their relatives. They also come down and they 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 start investigating the massacre. So the man who gathers up the children, who's responsible for that, his name was Jacob Forney, and he replaces Young as superintendent of Indian Affairs. So he is a federal appointee from the East that comes out. He's a good man. I just really admire him and his work. And he is interviewing um, perpetrators. He interviews John D. Lee. He interviews Isaac Haight. John M. Higby. And here's another thing, too. When he So Lee goes on and on and on in his account that these people have done these horrible things and they deserve to die. But um, uh, when they, it, Jacob Forney says when he interviews Isaac Haight and his counselor, John M. Higby, who are leaders, ringleaders, neither one of them give any reasons for, for white motive at all. They don't blame anyone else. So that's another reason I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. Um, so he starts gathering it up, all this information, and he starts heading north with those children he's gathered. Coming south at the same time is an army contingent and a federal judge, a federally appointed judge named John Cradlebaugh. And so they end up camping together. Cradlebaugh meets the children, interviews them. Forty gives to Cradlebaugh a list of all, a long list of all the men he believes are involved. Uh, the the militiamen who are involved in this, and he writes to um, he writes back east and says, "This will all be cleared up. These these men, I have all of the evidence. I have their names. When this is brought to trial, we can quickly bring these people to justice." John J. Cradlebaugh takes th that list. He has that. We know that from those letters. He comes down to Cedar City and he starts. He rents an empty house hmm. and he starts holding court, if you will. Hmm in Cedar City. And by now, a lot of people have abandoned Cedar City. Um, the Iron Mission, which many people were sent there to start, has failed. And probably some people want to leave after the massacre, like Rebecca's ancestor who goes Get out of Dodge. <laughs> um, like my ancestor as well. Um, so under cover of darkness, people start coming to Cradlebaugh's house in the middle of the night and knocking at his door in the dark. And he starts having people come in and they start telling him what they know of the Mountain Meadows Massacre. But they're so afraid. They say, if you see me on the street, don't ever acknowledge that I came here to tell you anything. Um, so there are people that are trying to tell the truth about what happened, whether they're just local people or perpetrators. We know one perpetrator uh, tells the whole story. We believe it's Philip Klingensmith because he later turns state's evidence and is off. He's, he's absolved from any... 
um, prosecution because of that. So uh, Cradlebaugh is working on prosecuting the case, and then the Army is called back from southern Utah. They're called back up to uh, the north, and so Cradlebaugh is like, I'm not safe to stay down here by myself, and so he leaves with them, and so the case is not prosecuted at that time. What happens next is the massacre becomes politicized. So another judge, federally appointed judge, um, he has all of that information that's given to him by Cradlebaugh and Forney. He has an all non-Mormon jury, but he refuses to go down to Cedar City to try the case. He does it in Nephi, so he can't get witnesses to come in, can't capture any of those who are um, on the list of, of being possible, uh, possibly guilty, and he declines to try the case. The reason why, and the reason why it takes so long for it to be tried is the Mountain Meadows Massacre becomes used as a political weapon. Um, local non-Mormons who are in the territory, they, they realize that the only way to take control of Utah territory is if you disenfranchise the Mormons. So you can't be a non-Mormon and run for office. It's not too much different today sometimes, but um, you can't be a non-Mormon and run for office in Utah and win. It's impossible because most of the electorate is LDS. So only Mormons are going to win political office and have political control and so forth. So they determine the only way to take control and to break up the theocracy and so forth is to disenfranchise Mormons so that they can't serve on juries, so that they can't vote, so on and so forth. And so they refuse to bring the um, Mount Meadows Massacre to trial. When they finally do in the 1870s, they... Um, they don't want a conviction of John D. Lee, who is one of the perpetrators who has been caught and put on trial. They want it to look like if you had, see, you can't get a, you can't, you can't even get a conviction for someone as notorious as John D. Lee for this notorious crime <laughs> in Utah, as long as Mormons can vote and as long as they can serve on juries and as long as they can be judges. I'm going really, really fast over the, the <laughs> surface here. You could read all the details in the book, but, um, and so they actually, they don't want Lee to be convicted. And then they try and say, see, you need to disenfranchise Latter-day Saints in Utah. Um, what happens in John D. Lee's second trial is a new federal judge is appointed. His name is Sumner Howard. He comes out to Utah. He doesn't have a dog in the fight. He just wants to try the man who's on trial and go after all of the criminals. So he wins a conviction of John D. Lee with a Mormon jury. And he says, look, you can try Mormons, or you can try and, and convict another Mormon in Utah. These folks that are trying to disenfranchise Mormons, they decide, mm, okay, Mountain Meadows isn't the tool that's working for this. So what do they decide to do? They decide to go after polygamy. And that's when all the anti-polygamy legislation starts. And that disenfranchises Latter-day Saints in Utah. Utah women who've been exercising the franchise since 1870, they lose their right to vote. Utah men who um, are support or are polygamous, they lose the right to vote. And all of these non-Mormons run for office. They sweep all the offices and they win and they become political leaders in Utah. So that's at the tail end of, mm. of this book and this story. Dang. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> mm. It's a lot. So how many years after, <laughs> this is so interesting, finally, is anybody brought to justice, quote yeah. justice, yeah. Um, and, and mm -hmm. only one person? I yeah. mean, a lot of people question John D. Lee, mm -hmm. scapegoat, you know, fall guy, this kind of thing. People yeah. cite reasons like, well, in 1961, his blessings were fully restored from the by the church. You know, mm -hmm. was he somebody that just kind of took the fall for everybody? There is yeah. that line of thinking. That, yeah, well, that's sure, that's there. that. And absolutely, John D. Lee uh, was the only man who was prosecuted mm -hmm. and executed, convicted and executed mm -hmm. for the crime, which many, many other men should have also gone down. However, John D. Lee was not innocent. He... Uh, the witnesses saw him murder people at the Mountain Meadows, and he was definitely a ringleader in it. So um, I'm against the death penalty, but did he uh, get what he deserved in being convic convicted? Absolutely. But many other people should have been as well. So to make a long story really quick, short, really quick, sure, yeah. Did Brigham Young know 
and approve of the um, capital punishment of John D. Lee. And mm -hmm. is it worth noting the familial-ish relationship between Brigham Young and John D. Lee? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Very so this is another. This is another um, legend that that we debunk. Um, it's actually in the first book more in detail in Massacre at Mountain Meadows. But so a lot of people say, well, John D. Lee was the adopted son of Brigham Young. Mm -hmm. So to understand what's going on with that, the early Latter-day Saints in Nauvoo believed in something called the law of adoption. And so you could be sealed to someone not just as a spouse or as a um, a literal you know, child or adopted child. You could be sealed to people just as fellow adults. Men to men even. Me, men to mm -hmm. men. Mm -hmm. And this is and an Orthodox multiple men. traditional LDS yep. church Yes, practice. in Illinois. It died out shortly after they got to Utah. So, so most modern Latter-day Saints have never even heard of this. I didn't know about it until I started studying it. Mm -hmm. So um, church leaders would have other men adopted to them through a sealing ceremony in the temple. Brigham Young had 50, some 50 men sealed to him or adopted to him through the law of adoption. John D. Lee was one of them. So they were both full grown men. John, you know, it's not like um, Brigham Young raised John D. Lee or anything like that. They were 11 years apart. So that's what that was. Um, but again, the, the law of adoption just kind of fell out of practice and even out of meaning not long after the saints arrived in Utah. So that was their relationship. But again, Brigham Young had multiple, multiple men adopted to him. And would he have known that John D. Lee was going to be executed? And yeah. would he have potentially been behind a scapegoating where, okay, we got to pick somebody, but let's protect all the others, sort of? Yeah. So again, that's another myth that we looked at. Um, and what we found was nine men are indicted for the crime in 1874. John D. Lee was one of them. So the others that I've talked about before were, of course, William Dame, Isaac Haight, John Higby, um, Philip Klingensmith, William Stewart, who was the one who killed uh, William Aiden, the emigrant M William Aiden, shortly after the initial attack, um, Samuel Jukes, and um, a couple of others that, let's see, I can't think of at the top of my head right now, but make a long story short, John D. Lee gets caught. <laughs> he gets arrested. And uh, in fact, there's a story that we have in the book. Oh, the where... others were on the lamp. Oh, yeah. They were, yeah, yeah. they were on the lamp. Okay. William Dame doesn't go on the lamp because he knows the only evidence that he gave the approval to Isaac Haight to, okay, yeah, go carry this out, call up the militia and go wipe these people out is verbal. And only one person witnessed that verbal agreement named William Barton. And that's that's it. So there's no there's no written documentation or anything. So he is arrested. He turns himself in, but there's not enough evidence to mm. to show that he okay. was this silent armchair leader. We know that uh, from lots of other sources they talk about that this happened, but it's nothing's written down. So he he gets off. Would Brigham have helped shelter and hide the? others that were convicted do we know so one thing that's interesting is is william dame he is called on a mission conveniently <laughs> <laughs> um and i can't remember the exact year it's in the book but um so he is called on a mission at some point before these trials like but then but then when he is indicted he does turn himself in and he spends a lot of time in prison just awaiting trial um, there's no habeas corpus <laughs> being practiced um, but eventually they what they what the attorneys do is they they get John D Lee and they say to John D Lee okay if you give us a satisfactory confession um, if you tell us everything you know then then we'll let you go you can turn state's evidence and we'll let you go so they go after one fish hoping to get a bit, bigger fish right William Dame um, so Lee gives his confession, but he doesn't name anyone who's currently in custody. He only names people that are on the lam or that have died. <laughs> and so the prosecutors, they take that confession and they say, oh, well, this confession isn't satisfactory. So now we're just going to use your confession to prosecute you. We've got all this, oh, this stuff. So Lee is furious. He <laughs> yeah. goes double cross. He's like, wait a minute. I was turning state's evidence and now you're using it against me. Now, um, hadn't he published a book of the account or not? Yes. So um, John D. Lee's defense attorney, his name was William Bishop. 
of Nevada. And in the first trial, I mentioned the prosecutors, they're not really even trying to get a conviction for Lee. And, and if anyone wants to, you don't have to take my word for it, you can read the trial testimony. If you go to mountainmeadowsmassacre.org and click trial transcripts, anyone can read hmm. All of the transcripts. But yeah. what is fascinating about that first trial is they rarely talk about John D. Lee. They don't produce any witnesses that say that they saw John D. Lee kill anyone. And they keep talking about Brigham Young and George A. Smith, the men who aren't on trial. And so it's clearly they're, they're, they're putting Young and Smith on trial in the court of public opinion. Um, the second trial, as I mentioned, they bring in a new attorney, Sumner Howard. He goes right after Lee, and he brings in eyewitnesses, and church leaders have have been offering for years to say, hey, if you want us, we can bring witnesses to the trial if you want us to help. So they help round up some eyewitnesses of the massacre. Nephi Johnson, um, a couple of other men, they testify that... Th Samuel Knight and Samuel, oh, I'm forgetting his last name, Sam McMurdy. The three of them testified that they see John D. Lee murder people. They personally witness it. Um, Sumner Howard wins the conviction of John D. Lee. And um, then he starts to continue to hope to prosecute others. So I always thought, and I think most people think that John D. Lee is convicted, end of story. But in fact, Sumner Howard is going over other perpetrators of the crime, and they're trying to catch them, but they're living on the lam, and the government kind of loses interest in funding this case to pay somebody to hunt down these, these perpetrators who are spread out all over the country. Um, you need money to do that. There's not a lot of funding, so there's not a lot of people who are interested in hunting these folks down, and eventually the case just dies out from public interest. And so John D. Lee was the only one. But but what's interesting is Sumner Howard even says, I think if I can get Lee to talk, I think maybe I can um, go as high as getting Brigham Young. He's open to going after Brigham Young, but nothing ever comes up. So. All right, Rebecca, let's do a firing round of questions <laughs> and try and get as many questions in our remaining time as possible. Ready, go. So yes, we'll keep it. You go absolutely. first. We'll no, take turns. I, I definitely feel that Brigham Young encouraged people that were involved to leave. My ancestor was sent to Hiram to settle, as I understand it. So that seems to me that perhaps Brigham Young said, just go over that can, direction. Can I, can I jump in and say one yeah, thing? Yeah, no. So one thing I've noticed, not just in this story, but just studying church history in general, like everyone's ancestor was a bodyguard of Joseph Smith. Of course. <laughs> of course. Or, or Anytime, somewhere or to the do other something thing yes. is anytime somebody went to settle something there well Brigham Young yes. sent him there yes. so so I've just I mean that could be true I'm just saying just be just be careful of uh Brigham Young wasn't in fact sent I mean sending he's sending a lot of people but not every single soul was he saying oh my my ancestor was sent exactly. to this neighborhood by Brigham Young no, and, and so. that makes sense. And again, this is why, you know, we say these things that we learn anecdotally from our families, but Absolutely. you're looking at the source documents. Right. And that's a question that I have. Um, you didn't use Mormonism Unveiled at all in oh, your book. That's Lee's think. book, right? You asked me about that book. Yeah, you did. And, and so I think it's important for people to understand that you and Richard had access to documents that no one has ever been able to look at before. Documents that Juanita, you know, was desperate to get her hands on, yeah. knew existed, the firsthand accounts. Now, mm -hmm. I think that's very interesting to just even bring up that those first-hand accounts, the testimonies that were given, you know, very close to the time, no one else has ever seen those. So yeah. when you talk about debunking, you do mean that you're looking at things that no one has ever been able to see before. Yeah. So it, maybe talk a little bit about that, because I think that's kind of important, just these first-hand sources and the things that you're learning. No one else has ever been able to get their hands on those. Right, so. absolutely. And um, I think that's a great tragedy. Um, Juanita Brooks learns, she knows that there was a, an assistant church historian named Andrew Jensen, who in 1892, the first presidency sends him to Southern Utah to um, interview perpetrators and witnesses of just people who were living in Cedar City at the time. And they send a letter with him and they say, show this letter to local people. And this letter says, and we have a copy of it, um, but it says, uh, we know that a lot of witnesses to this crime and participants in the crime are dying. Please tell Brother Jensen everything you know of the crime, and, and including there's perpetrators that talk to him, and uh, gather all up, up all these interviews, and then someday when the time is right, we'll make these available to the world. Juanita Brooks knew that those documents 
existed, those affidavits existed. She goes to the church um, headquarters to try and get permission for them. She's denied access to them, uh, which was a tragedy. We got access to them. And we, a lot of the information I've been talking about and sharing and that's cited in our books are from those documents. And if anyone wants to see those documents, mm -hmm. holographs, pictures of those documents with transcripts of them, they are now published in a book called Mountain Meadows Massacre Documents, the Andrew Jensen and David Morris Collections. Go online, you can grab that book, read them. It's, it's fascinating. So yeah, I mean, because we had so much access to everything in the church archives, which now historians, other historians do have that access to now as well. Um, and we had a team of researchers that scoured the country, um, found information about the Mountain Meadows Massacre in 30, in archives in 31 states. We had a mountain of research to work with. So, you know, anyone who um, is hearing this or is interested in Mountain Meadows Massacre, you don't have to take my word for it. Um, but I would invite you to read the book, look at the documentation and, and come up with your own conclusions. All right, we'll keep going back and forth. So uh, yeah. you're next, Rebecca. So th this question, I hope you receive it okay. It's one of the one of the uh, most commonly asked questions I received when I kind of announced when we announced that we were going to be covering this mm -hmm. book, and I apologize that it's about another author, but I'm going to ask it anyway. I'm sure you've gotten this before. Please don't take offense. The question <laughs> is: Can you ask her what her thoughts are around Will Bagley, the late mm -hmm. Will Bagley, mm -hmm. um, and other Morton Mountain Meadows Massacre scholars? who believe that that Turley's book, I don't like that phrasing. Turley's um, book, uh, Tur Turley had co-authors. Barbara and <laughs> Turley's book, and maybe the previous book, yeah. believe that these books are part of the cover-up. Now, I, hmm. I know that's an offensive question, yeah. but I also know you're strong. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I get, uh, when it comes to Mount Meadows, you wouldn't believe the questions and that I, I don't feel yeah. defensive at all. Yeah. Um, why would people I, say that? I, what I, I what? would just say, I would just invite people to read the book. Um, anyone who has read these, particularly Vengeance is Mine, says, boy, this is not apologetic. <laughs> this is really, they, they tell me how much they appreciate how forthcoming it is and how willing it is to, to just say, yeah, there's some hor horrible things that happen. And so I would just invite people to, to, to read the book and, and draw their own conclusions. So... Okay. Does that answer the question? Sure. Or, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, do you, if, if if I don't even know if you'd be able to answer this, but if like Bagley was alive, sure. Do you know what criticism he might make of either of these? Well, books? I can. Uh, uh, um, sadly, um, Will, who's a friend of mine, died um, before this book came out. But um, I can tell you about the first book. He felt like um, it did place too much blame on like this conflict between victims and local folks. And I would say, based on my additional research, I would agree with that today. Oh. Sure. With yeah. his criticism of the first book. Yeah, with that with that yeah. aspect of right. the first book. Um, Will went with the theory that um, uh, the massacre was due to religious fanaticism and these people just wiped out these other these people from Arkansas because Parley P. Pratt had been killed in Arkansas. So that was his theory. I disagree with that theory. And the reason why I disagree with it is just it just is historical documentation doesn't hold up to it. Um, so so I know that um, and and will believe that Brigham Young ordered the massacre based and he would always acknowledge there is no hard evidence to show it based on circumstantial evidence. I believe um, Brigham Young ordered it. And again, I don't I don't really care <laughs> what people choose to believe. I would just invite people to to read all they can about the massacre and then draw their own conclusions. So, love it, love it. Mm -hmm. Your do turn. You, do you feel that you <laughs> did have access to all the documents that there 100%. are? Do you feel that there's mm -hmm. anything that's been left out? That's the question that comes up. Yeah. All, you know, new information. Yeah. And I agree. A lot of yeah. things that Will Bagley brought up that he disagreed with. In our book club, we read, we in September, we had a, what we called a Mountain Meadows mashup in the Good Book Club. <laughs> Everybody could pick any book they wanted that's to read awesome. of a huge Great. variety. Mm -hmm. We had a huge conversation about it, you know. And it was really exciting to see the different points of view. And everybody did agree that in Vengeance of Mine, is mine you definitely took it a step farther as far as debunking some of those rumors mm -hmm. and things like that so yeah. everybody could really appreciate that mm -hmm. one of the questions was with the documents do you, do you feel there's any sense that the church might have withheld things nope. things that would have been a more uh, nope. painted in a negative light no we had 100 percent access to everything and again I, we should share the genesis of this this idea exactly. um, so rick turley had the idea to um write the book 
in the early 2000s. And his mindset was, look, we are never going to move past this very, very hideous stain on our history by just trying to pretend it didn't happen, not talking about it, covering it up. The only way we're going to move past this is by shining all the sunshine we can on it, making it not a taboo topic to talk about anymore, and just laying it all out saying sorry, owning it, and, and only then can we seek reconciliation and peace. So that was his mindset starting out. Um, there was never a mindset of, oh, we're just going to write more books to cover this up. It was, <laughs> let's get it out in the open. And he went to the um, First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve when he had the idea to do this and said, this is what I want to do. Will I have you know support for doing this in the church history department? And I don't want any uh, opposition. And I also don't, um, we're going to let the chips fall where they may. I don't want any censorship. This did not go through the correlation department. It never would have made it through. It's too violent. Um, it reminds but, me of Leonard Arrington. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. So, so that was the approach. Outcome. With yeah. the better outcome. With the better outcome. Yeah, so I think, <laughs> yeah. So I think if you know the genesis of why these books exist, um, and, and I will say, again, just from personal experience and then watching it from institutional experience, it's just laying it all out and just saying, this is the horrific... I, I'm, proud, I'm proud of the church for um, allowing this to take place. Rick and I, when we wrote the book, we wrote it independently. We weren't working for um, the church history department at the end of it anymore. But for the church to support, yeah, okay, let's just tell it all and mm. get it out there. And only then can we move on. Love it. Yeah. All right. Some guy named Landon Brophy, and I'm just kidding. He's Rebecca's co host. <laughs> yeah, well, Landon's uh, a friend. Hi, Landon. Um, <laughs> Landon he, loves to ask questions. It's awesome. He, he does. Writes, it's awesome. He writes, is it possible that they went after Brigham Young because they knew they couldn't get a conviction in Utah unless they got Young on the hot seat? And he'd have to save himself, which is exactly what happened. That's his question. Sure, I mean, the, absolutely, there were polo political motivations to to go after Brigham Young. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, they, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, we found the same evidence that was found at the time. There's just there's not the evidence just doesn't document that he ordered a massacre. He did other things, all these other things we've been talking about that that created that. But she absolutely, was political, very political. It's probably. And I know Rebecca's next. It's probably fair to say that given how the church wasn't forthcoming about polygamy for a long, long time, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. it wasn't beyond top church, more LDS church leaders oh, yeah. to deceive the oh, government. Of right? course. And, uh, cover, yeah. and to cover things oh, up. Oh, of course. I mean, yeah. one of the other I write about really inspiring, <laughs> happy topics in Mormon history. The other topic I'm an um, expert on is post manifesto polygamy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, absolutely, the church was, was trying to hide um, the truth about its practice of polygamy. Sure. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So that could have been the case here, but historians have to rely on the evidence, not speculation. Well, no, I think that definitely that there was church cover. They didn't want this known in the, you know, the yeah. broader story yeah yeah yeah, yeah they, i mean it's not something you're you're proud of that your church participates in. and you don't want to be destroyed as a nation as a yes, state right yes <laughs> exactly you know and and if you think again of the latter day saints having violently been driven from missouri and illinois in just the prior decades just recently that would be like in the 2010s for us something traumatic happening yeah um they were at fear for their very existence. Yeah. And there were people who investigated the crime, including um, some of the army men and so forth, that say, we need to just wipe these people off the face of the earth. Literally, they're saying, wipe these people off Gen the Gentiles. face. Gentiles. Gentiles mm -hmm. saying that. Yeah. Genocide. Yeah. They're, they're, they're talking about just wiping yeah. ladders. So there was true fear for their very existence. Yeah. Now it's 165 years later. There's not that concern anymore. Mormonism's here to stay. So mm -hmm. yeah. it's not the threat that it once was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it'd be interesting, perhaps, to talk about the site. Um, mm -hmm. I know you don't have much time. Like I said, we visited several times. A lot of people, I think, sometimes feel, okay, the church um, preserved the site to preserve their narrative. That's one of the criticisms, right? Mm -hmm. The signage. Mm -hmm. When you do go there, mm -hmm. the signage is a little vague. I mean, when I went there, we were Zooming a book club meeting. I had camera equipment with me, so people thought somehow I knew. So people that were visiting, they're like, what happened here? And they're standing in front of yeah. a plaque and a sign. Yeah. They really could not tell. So there's this sense, perhaps, that the preservation also has 
an ulterior motive of yeah. controlling the narrative a little more. Sure. But then again, it is wonderful that the site is being preserved. So maybe talk yeah. about, maybe people don't know exactly what's happened at the site, a, a brief history of pres preservation and, yeah. and narrative, maybe. Uh, how much time do we have? I know, that's what I'm saying. We have a couple <laughs> seconds. Right. But it's I know, a very I'm important sorry. topic. It's, so it's a very important oh, topic. No. And unless, a you can, unless you can question. extend, but we have, <laughs> yeah. if we get you out of a hard stop, because we got like yeah. four minutes. But no, this is very important, and it's a great question. Um, so the monument at the Mountain Meadows was first created in 1859 by U.S. Army. They, they gathered up the remaining, um, the remains of the victims that were scattered throughout the valley and uh, created a, a large monument, which is at the spot where that monument is today. In 1859, um, it was destroyed a couple of times. We could go, that's a whole other story, but um, by Juanita Brooks's time, like later in her life, it's just fallen into disrepair because it's just kind of a, a tumble of stones. And it, you know, eventually the stones fall apart if they're not cemented together. Um, and so it just kind of fell in disrepair. It was e difficult to get to. Um, make a long story short, once a descendant of a victim and a descendant of a perpetrator happened to meet up there and said, we, we want to come together in a spirit of reconciliation and make a, a better and another monument. And so it's called Dan Sill Hill, working with the, the U.S. Forest Service. They built a monument. We went up there together when yeah. we did a tour it together, and there's a monument with the the names of those known to have been killed in the Mountain Meadows at the time, and the two groups working with the state of Utah said, uh, we don't want to lay any blame here because we don't really know what happened, so we're mm. just going to list the names of the people mm -hmm. and, and then put it in the passive. Well, bad things happen in the past. So Mistakes that was were made, 1990. But not by me. Mistakes yeah. were made. So that was 1990. So again, I feel, I feel like that monument, though, now is historical because it kind of shows how, mm -hmm. okay, we're going to acknowledge something happened here. We're right. going to acknowledge that people died here, yep. but we're not going to say what happened, which was kind of the mindset in 1990. So, Gradually, there's more and more information now. So recently, more signs have been more signs have been put up um, by the the federal government explaining more about what happened and so forth. The other additional granite markers that have been put up were written by descendants groups, descendants of the victims, and put up. Um, yeah, I certainly it's it's an interesting debate whether the the church the church owns the land. Mm -hmm though it is a national historic landmark status. So the, the church is controlled by the federal government, what it can and cannot do there. So in other words, it's permanently preserved, okay? Um, there is a debate that whether or not the church should not own it anymore and it should be a national monument, which would mean the federal government would run it and the church would have no say in anything that happens there. So again, if that happens, then the, churches, the church loses the opportunity to have a voice in the story that's told there. So there's that debate. That's true. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. My 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 thing personally is I just want to see the Mount Meadows preserved and taken well care of, right? If the government takes over, we we know that the federal government doesn't have necessarily the funding that the church has put into protecting this land. So it's an interesting debate. I'm not sure what the what the the right answer is, but yeah, that's certainly a debate. It's ongoing. Do you have one second to talk about the quilt? It's such a positive oh, sure. thing to end on if we only have a few minutes. This is a great story, John. You'll love this. <laughs> so, okay, so this was back before I knew I was a descendant of a perpetrator. And when I've talked about um, reconciliation efforts I was involved in, one of those was um, I was talking to Diane Fancher, who is a descendant. And she just said, you know, if we bring all of our life, we were talking about how wonderful it was, the, the reconciliation that was starting to take place. And she was staying at our home. And she said, we're, our lives are like threads. And if we bring all of our threads together, we can make a beautiful quilt. And then I lay awake thinking about that one night. And I thought, what if we literally made two quilts? Um, one for Arkansas and one for Utah. And... I decided to run with it. I reached out to my aunt, Anna Rolap, who was a professional quilter, and we designed this gorgeous quilt. And I rounded up folks who were descendants of victims and perpetrators and asked them to share any message they wanted on a square and that we would incorporate them into these two quilts. And so we made those two quilts. Um, 
they're gorgeous. One is in the Carroll County Courthouse, and the other is in um, the Old County Courthouse. I'm just, it's the Washington County Museum is what it's named now today, mm -hmm. but it's in St. George. Yep. It's open to the public. If you go upstairs, you can see this mm -hmm. quilt. And there are 36 quilt squares, half made by descendants of perpetrators, half made by descendants of victims, or just members of um, the church. Rick Turley made a square. Marlon Jensen made a square. I made a square. What's interesting about the second quilt is I had finished writing my embroidery, my thought, when I found out I was a descendant of a perpetrator. And so I quickly added and I squished it in between one of the lines, descendant of William S. Holly. So you can see that if you visit the St. George quilt. Yeah, Beautiful. I've seen your quilt. It's amazing. And it's so powerful. Like I said, we took some book club, a group there. Some of them had to literally leave the room just <clears throat> looking at the quilt. Because one thing that's so powerfully visual about it is that each family is represented by a vine and the the children and that were left alive are little rosebuds with their names, but also on the vine are the leaves of the family members that were killed. So it mm -hmm. absolutely yeah, every represents, name. here's two little rosebuds. Those are children that mm -hmm. were under eight yeah. that lived, but here's, you know, 10 leaves of family members that mm -hmm. were killed. And when you see that going all the way around the quilt, it's a very powerful visual image of exactly yeah. what happened. So. And if anyone wants to see images of the quilt, they can just Google mm -hmm. um, Mount Meadows Massacre Reconciliation Quilts. You can, you can find pictures of them. I also wanted to share, so a lot of times people come up to me after I speak and say, I want to say I'm sorry. How do I express my sorrow mm -hmm. to a descendant of a of, of a victim? I set up a, a Gmail account. It's uh, MMM, as in Mountain Meadows Massacre, reconciliation at gmail.com. If you send any message that you want to share there, I will um, make sure that I share that with uh, descendants of victims. Beautiful. Couple super micro questions. Has any have any reparations ever been offered or paid that you're aware of? No. Descendants of victims uh, always say we don't want it's not about money for us. What they want again is the the land protected and a lot of money has been spent to preserve and protect and purchase that land from local ranchers. Okay. So. Um their <clears throat> land and NRFM are both sort of wondering, number mm -hmm. one, would would uh is, would you welcome a book about the Mountain Meadows Massacre written by Never Mormons historians? Of course, absolutely, one hundred percent. And then, the, the and more, then would the, more the same, books, the and then would the same records that were available to y'all yes. likely be available to Never Mormon historians? Do absolutely. You think? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if anyone wants to come see me, and I'll I'll help you. I'll show you stuff. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the more the more people write about it and spread the word about it, the better. Absolutely. Oh. Yeah. Well, you've, I, I think you've maybe understated your role in, mm -hmm. in helping bring both insight, but also reconciliation. So I just want to personally, mm -hmm. knowing a little bit about that story, I just want to, mm -hmm. um, you know, on behalf of my audience and people who care about our people, mm -hmm. I want to personally thank you for what you've done, uh, navigating a very difficult thing, but producing books that absolutely no one can question that your books move the narrative forward in very positive ways to you and Richard. Thank you, John. That means a lot to me. Um, it means a lot when people say that because it has been um, my life's mission. So thank you. Yeah, our pleasure. Thank you. Rebecca? <laughs> Yep, Barbara's amazing, and yeah. <laughs> Mountain Meadows Massacre matters. It matters today, and it's worth looking into, and Barbara has done incredible work that lets us all learn things. It's helped me reconcile things about my own ancestor mm -hmm. that I never really thought I'd be Good. more at peace. I'm not completely at peace, but much more at peace, which is wonderful. So mm -hmm. um, just thank you, John, again, for letting me be on. Remind everybody, pick up Sasha Sagan's book, and if you haven't, if you have not paused this video and ordered Vengeance of Mine, for heaven's sakes, do it. This is incredible book and we're gonna nag the author of the romney book yes what's his name please. again McKay, uh, McKay McKay Coppins. Coppins. Yeah. if anyone has a connection let's nag do it this will be amazing maybe we get... could get mitt romney on 
Yeah, we're going to try to get David McCraney of How Minds Change. I have to answer this. Kid Freshy writes, John should stop with the hair dye. I am a freak of nature. (laughs) I've never dyed my hair ever once in my life. But for some reason, I have a gray goatee, but my hair is less gray. My husband's the same way. My husband's the same way. He's always had dark hair. And then his last goatee he grew out, it was white. So I said, oh, shave that thing off, Matt. (laughs) If you want to give a shout out to um, Signature books sure. and, and how people can support it please freaking buy this book right now <laughs> go buy vengeance is mine buy it through benchmark if you can or just through amazon or wherever books are sold you can buy it in audio yeah. format which i recommend Deseret books Deseret sells book. it. oh wow mm-hmm. that's amazing wow. yep. yeah yeah who can claim um, that and yeah. barnes and noble but yeah, yeah try and support a local person but if not it's available on amazon and then if people want to support signature books oh sure so i'm the director of signature books and check us out signaturebooks.com we do fantastic fantastic books. Our latest one we just did was Sarah Patterson's September 6th and The Struggle for the Soul of Mormonism. Our next big one coming out is D. Michael Quinn's memoir called Chosen Path. That's coming out December 18th. I'd love to come on and talk about that one as well. Absolutely. And check out Mormonish Podcast uh, with with Rebecca and Landon. (laughs) Awesome. And then just finally, we uh, have lost a lot of donors over the past uh, months and year or two, and we're only able to continue providing these services with your support. So if you are not cur- if you are a donor, thank you. We couldn't do this without you. Our sincere thanks. If you're not a supporter of Mormon Stories and the Open Stories Foundation, and you want to see this type of content continue, if you want to pay it forward for others, all you got to do is go to mormonstories.org, click on the donate button, become a monthly donor, and um, we will do our best to keep providing this content. Weirdly, we've had a significant drop in donations, and we've had our best year ever by an order of magnitude. So I don't know exactly, uh, well, I have some thoughts on why that is, but regardless, um, please support us if you can. Uh, and again, Barbara, you're the best. Rebecca, you're the best. Be good to each other. Be kind to each other. We'll see you all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Take care, Thanks. everybody. Okay. You did make me cry. <laughs>